Let us stand as we worship this day. I'm already a couple minutes behind. I got an extra hour of sleep. I'm still behind. Let's praise the Lord this morning. To God be the glory. To God be the glory. Great things he has done. So love me the world that he gave us. morning. Let's put our hands together for the Lord there this morning. We sing of this amazing grace.
Let's pray, church family. Father, we are so grateful for all that you do, for all that you are, for all that you have done for us. So Lord, as we come into this place and we worship you, Father, we just ask, Father, that our worship just be a fragrant offering up to you. Spirit, we ask for you to move, speak to us this day, speak to those who do not have a relationship with you, those in this room that today would be the day of their salvation. We're so grateful for all that you have done and all that you continue to do. It's in your name that we pray. Amen. You may be seated. Well, we're very excited to be here in worship today. We had a great 8 o'clock service. For those of you who may not know, we're having 8 o'clock services the first Sunday of the month in November, December, January, and February. So you're welcome to show up next week at 8 o'clock, but we will then enlist you into the choir. Or into the orchestra, we got recorders, all right? We can find some kazoos. Now, if you're a guest of ours, I hope that you've already felt a very warm welcome this morning. We're so excited that you're here. What we'd ask for everyone to do is to look at the back uh, of the pew in front of you, and you'll see these connection cards. And what we would ask for you to do, if you're a guest, fill out this information to the best of your ability. Turn it into the offering plate. You could even include on the back a prayer request. If you're a member, you don't need to put out all your information, but just write your name, write a prayer request, and know that we will pray for you this week, Tuesdays especially during staff meeting. In a moment, we will have a children's sermon, but what I'm going to ask for everyone to do is to stand up, find someone you don't know, and give them a very warm welcome.
good group of kids here. Now, the pastor finished his recent sermon series on what? Who, what have we been talking about the past few weeks? Olivia? Prayer. Prayer. Bingo. All right. Woo! Pastor Mark's really happy this morning. Yeah. Extra candy for you today, okay? All right. And so today we're going to start a new series. The pastor's going to be teaching us through Jonah. Anybody know about Jonah? Can anybody tell me about the book of Jonah? He got stuck in the belly of a whale. Wow. Man, that would be a big whale for me to get stuck there, right? <laughs> Woo, that's a big whale. So he got stuck in the belly of a whale. But here's the important part about Jonah. Jonah was running from God, right? And so the pastor, I'm still in a little bit of a sermon this morning, so I heard it at 8 o'clock, so I'm kind of morphing it into yours. So you can just go home after this and consider yourself taught, right? But anyway, that was a joke. It was kidding. But Jonah was running from God. God had told him to go to a people and tell them that the things they were doing were evil. And Jonah ran. And Jonah thought he could hide from God. Is that a good thing? No, that's not a very good thing. You know, my little boy, Truett, always thinks that if he closes his eyes that I can't see him. Does that work? It does? Well, let's try it, okay? We're going to all close our eyes and we're going to see if we disappear in front of the congregation, okay? Everybody close your eyes. Congregation, can you see us? Oh, that didn't work. Man, I knew it. But that's okay. I brought another thing for us. My wife doesn't know that earlier this morning I took this out of our closet. I got a big sheet. We're going to cover up some of us. It's probably not big enough for all of us. This is another method, okay? So, hold Dominique, I'm going to trust you with the microphone. Is that okay? All right, hold on to it. All right, let's try this. The eyes didn't work. Can y'all see those in the sheet now? No. Wow, they can still see us, but they can't see you guys. Do you think God still sees them? Yes. You know, just like Jonah learned, sorry guys, I'm going to take it away from you. Just like Jonah learned, even in the belly of the whale, God sees us, right? Ooh, there's some nice staticky hair. So even in the belly of the whale, God sees us. When we try to hide from God, God sees us, right? And so here's what I've learned in my life, my old, old life. It's just simply this. Just quit running from God and just do what God tells you, right? And you know why? Because God loves us and wants to protect us, and his plan is far better than any plan that we might have, okay? And so y'all remember that as Pastor teaches us about Jonah this morning, right? Let's pray. Father, Lord, we just thank you that you love us enough that you see us wherever we are. Lord, we thank you that even though we run and we try to hide and, and we may go into the, the belly of the ship, the belly of the whale, we may run to a different state, a different city, we may run from you. Father, as far as we think possible, but you still know where we are. You still love us and you still care for us. I hope and, hope and pray this morning, Father, that you would be with these boys and girls, that they may know that you love them and that you care for them. And may they not run from you, Father, but may they run to you as they listen to your voice. And we give you the praise in your son's name. Amen. Let's stand as we continue to worship. We got to sing this early this morning, but I don't think I'll get tired of singing this one. It's one of those I'll get to sing forever and all eternity. Bless the Lord, oh my soul, oh my soul, worship His holy name. Sing like never before, oh my soul, I worship Your holy name. The sun 
choir departs and the orchestra sounds, I pray right now, Holy Spirit of God, you would empower your pastor to proclaim your word, that Holy Spirit, you would convict hearts, and we would leave here changed for your glory and yours alone. I pray that in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Chris. Thank you, choir and orchestra, for doing such a wonderful job. But I just have to call the men out. All right, men. There's about a thousand women in the choir loft today, and there were six men, okay? I know we can do better, because you don't want Bill, Bryce, and I filling up those extra men up there, okay? So if you have a voice, and you can make a joyful noise, and you are a man, we need to see you in the choir, okay? Five o'clock tonight. There is a choir practice. You can do that. Broncos game will be over. So come on. We won't talk about the Broncos season, whether or not it will be over. All right? Now, I heard a good joke this morning. I just wanted to pass along. So, Daylight Savings Sunday is the worst day of the year for pastors. You want to know why? You don't? Okay. Okay. Well, moving on, moving on, moving right along. Okay, you want to know. Well, Beth wants to know, and Beth wins. So, Beth, do you know why Daylight Saving Sunday is the worst day for pastors? Because everybody has an extra hours of sleep. So when they fall asleep during the sermon, it's not because they're tired. Okay? I'm talking about you all. Larry, I see you, and I will call you out. All right. Now, next Sunday is a big Sunday in the life of our church. It is Mission Sunday. It's also Operation Christmas Child Sunday. Um, I've challenged the church to bring in at least a thousand shoeboxes because every shoebox represents a child, a child that may not hear the gospel otherwise and may not get to open a gift on Christmas if we don't bring those boxes. So, next Sunday. Our goal is a 1,000, and you can look around the room between this service and the first service. It don't mean that everybody needs to bring about two shoeboxes, all right? Can you do that, guests? That means you too, so we need your help to hit our goal. Now, this Saturday, we're going to have our second Walk the Walk Bible distribution. What I would love to see is for every home within about a one-mile radius of our church campus to receive a Bible from our church family. We're still, if you are still in need of a service project for Rock the City, Walk the Walk would be a great opportunity for you. Last month, we passed out somewhere between 350 uh, and 400 Bibles and hope to do double this Saturday. So come on and help. We're going to start here at 1 o'clock in the lobby. So we need you. If you're a fan of the Aggies, your season's over. Be here anyway, right? This morning begins a new sermon series. From the book of Jonah, called The Reluctant Missionary. And the reason why we're looking at the book of Jonah is that really for November, we're going to focus on missions. Next Sunday being Mission Sunday. And I would encourage you to be here for the 1045 service next week, uh, because we'll have some unique worship elements, as well as we'll hear a testimony from Yuri Kramen, the pastor of Bethel Community Church. So we'd encourage you to be here. Let me ask you to open your Bibles or your Bible apps to Jonah chapter 1. If you know where Matthew is, the first book of the New Testament, just take a pinch of pages and go to the left. If you're using a Bible app and you can't find Jonah, I can't help you. Okay? Should be pretty easy. If you use version on your mobile device, you can find our service as an event in that app. And again, I can't help you. If you don't know how to do that. Now, one day, a telemarketer called a home. And a small voice answered and whispered, hello. Well, hello, what is your name? Still whispering, the voice said, Jimmy. Well, how old are you, Jimmy? I'm four. Well, good. Is your mother home? Yes, but she's busy. Okay, Was your father home? Yes, 
but he's busy too. I see. Well, who else is there? The police. The police. May I speak with one of them? They're busy. Well, are there any other grown-ups there? Yes, the firemen. Okay, and may I speak with one of the firemen, please? They're all busy. Well, Jimmy, all those people in your house, and I can't talk to one of them? What are they doing? They're looking for me, answered Jimmy. <laughs> Now, while Jimmy was able to run and to hide, at least for a little while, from his parents, from the police, and from the firefighters, the opposite is true in today's passage. Jonah tried and failed to run and hide from God. So the main idea of today's passage is a simple one. It's probably a little bit of an obvious one if you're familiar with the story of Jonah. It's simply this, try as we might, you can't run and you can't hide from God. So let me ask you to join with me in reading Jonah chapter 1, and we're going to start in verse 1. It says, Now the word of the Lord came to Jonah, the son of Amittai, saying, Arise and go to Nineveh, that great city, and call out against it, for their evil has come up before me. But Jonah rose to flee to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. He went down to Joppa, and he found a ship going to Tarshish. So he paid the fare and went down into it to go with them to Tarshish away from the presence of the Lord. But the Lord hurled a great wind upon the sea, and there was a mighty tempest on the sea, so that the ship threatened to break up. Then the mariners were afraid, and each cried out to his God, and they hurled the cargo that was in the ship into the sea to lighten it for them. But Jonah had gone down into the inner part of the ship and had laid down and was fast asleep. So the captain came and said to him, What do you mean, you sleeper? Arise and call out to your God. Perhaps the God will give a thought to us that we may not perish. They said to one another, Come, let us cast lots, that we may know on whose account this evil came upon us. So they cast lots, and the lot fell on Jonah. Then they said to him, Tell us, on whose account this evil has come upon us? What is your occupation? Where do you come from? What is your country? And of what people are you? And Jonah said to them, I am a Hebrew, and I fear the Lord, the God of heaven, who made the sea and the dry land. Then the men were exceedingly afraid and said to him, What is this that you have done? For the men knew that he was fleeing from the presence of the Lord, because he had told them. So they said to him, What shall we do, that the sea may quiet down for us? For the sea grew more and more tempestuous. He said to them, Pick me up and hurl me into the sea, and the sea will quiet down for you. For I know it is because of me that this great tempest has come upon you. Nevertheless, the men rode hard to get back to the dry land, but they could not, for the sea grew more and more tempestuous against them. Therefore they called out to the Lord, O Lord, let us not perish for this man's life, and lay not on us innocent blood, for you, O Lord, have done as it pleased you. So they picked up Jonah, and they hurled him into the sea, and the sea ceased from its raging. Then the men feared the Lord exceedingly. And they offered a sacrifice to the Lord and made vows. Let's pray. Father, we want to thank you. Thank you that your word gives to us some great examples of people to follow of faith. And it even gives us here in Jonah an example of someone not to follow. So, Father, as we just look at his disobedience to you, I pray, Father, open our hearts our eyes, our minds, exactly what you want us to understand. Or that we may never run from you. And Father, I pray that if there's anybody in this room who's heard the truth and will hear the truth today, maybe even for the first time, that they will not run. They will not run away. 
but they will run to you. So we ask for you to speak. It's in your name that we pray. Amen. Now, Jonah is one of the most unique books in the Bible. We don't know who the author is. We don't think that Jonah wrote it himself. Jonah doesn't give us verses, really, that we memorize or that we sort of plaster on our walls. Jonah doesn't give us a hero. Jonah is not a hero of our faith, and he is the exact opposite. His response is the exact opposite of what God would have from us. But Jonah does tell us a story, and it's a story that has captivated people throughout time. Now, you may know Jonah's story, and you may know that he was swallowed by a great fish. And you may be sitting there wondering, is that possible? Is that true? And let me just invite you back to next week when we'll address that next week. How can we, with confidence, know that Jonah was, in fact, swallowed by a great fish? Now, interestingly, Jonah first appears in Scripture not in this book, but in 2 Kings. 2 Kings 14.25, we're told how God uses Jonah before sending him to Nineveh. God has used him, and he's obeyed God in the past. In 2 Kings 14.25, we're told that King Jeroboam II restored the border of Israel from Lebo Hamath as far as the Sea of Arabah, according to the word of the Lord, the God of Israel, which he spoke by his servant, Jonah, the son of Amittai, the prophet. Now, it is this fact that God has already used Jonah, and Jonah already obeyed, and God used him in a mighty way that makes Jonah's disobedience here so shocking. It's this disobedience that we see in the first few verses, which drives home the major point of this book, to experience the grace of God. And let me just ask you, have you experienced the grace of God? To experience the grace of God and not be willing to tell others of His grace and compassion is a tragedy. But it's a tragedy that's all too familiar. Each one of us, each one of us in this room, at one time or another, has been unwilling to share the gospel. So the first thing that we must learn from Jonah, learn from his example, and allow God to change within us, is that we always, in every instance, obey God's calling. It's the first one. Obey God's calling. Jonah responded to God's calling with disobedience. In fact, we see that Jonah's disobedience starts for him a downward spiral. God told Jonah to go up, and Jonah responded by going down. In verse 2, God, excuse me, in verse 3, We're told that Jonah went down into Joppa. He then goes down into the ship. In verse 5, he goes down into the lowest part of the vessel. And then he lays down and goes to sleep. And later, he goes down into the water. Downward spirals happen when we hear from God and we disobey his calling. Jonah is a reluctant missionary. Because God tells Jonah to go, really just on a short-term mission trip, and Jonah refuses to go, but Jonah is not unique. Too many, even here in this room, too many believe that they have never been called to go and to share the gospel. And if that's your attitude, let me ask you to listen to these words of William Booth, the founder of the Salvation Army. He said, not called do you say? Not heard the call, I think you should say. Put your ear down to the Bible and hear God bid you go and pull sinners out of the fire of sin. Put your ear down to the burden, agonizing heart of humanity and listen to its pitiful wail for help. Go stand by the gates of hell and hear the damned entreat you to go to their father's house. And bid their brothers and sisters and servants and masters not to come there. Then look Christ in the face, 
whose mercy and grace you have professed to obey. And tell them whether you will join heart and soul and body and all that you are in the march to proclaim His grace and mercy into all the world. What is striking is that even over a century ago, Christians were waiting for their call before obeying, before venturing out for the sake of the gospel. Not much has changed. For us, we don't like to leave our comfortable, cul-de-sac, suburban Christianity if it's not necessary, if it's not clear, and if we feel like we've not been called. Jesus says, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. So we already have a clear calling to begin with. And the specifics of what that looks like will follow in the path of obedience. God leads us in motion. In few other areas of life, think about it. In few other areas of life do we say, you know what, I'm going to wait till God calls me before I obey. God talks to us through His Word and through His Spirit. Have you heard His voice? In His Word, God commands us to go, each and every one of us, to go and to complete the task He has given. He doesn't put age limits on us. He doesn't say, therefore, go between the ages of 18 and 40. He says, therefore, go. No one is too young and no one is too old. So God speaks to us through His Word and God speaks to us through His Spirit. You see it here. In the first few verses of Jonah, God speaks. There should be times in our worship services. There should be times in our daily walks with God that He speaks to each and every one of us. He will never speak in contradiction of His Word, but He speaks in concert with His Word. And if you have not heard from God, if you have never heard from God, specifically heard, from Him to go, to tell, to share, to to somebody, the when, the where, the how, and the who. If you've never heard that from God, I think you need to start listening. Start listening. In your times alone with God this week, listen. In your time in God's Word and in prayer this week, listen. Listen. Because God talks to all of us. And He has in mind for each of us a someone, a somewhere. And He tells us to go. Take a moment or two to listen to God this week. Don't be so busy or so done that you read a chapter or two from His Bible. You say a perfunctory prayer and then you move on with your day. Take time to listen. Now before we move on, we do have to ask ourselves the why. If God has told Jonah to go to Nineveh, and we know that Jonah has spoken on God's behalf before, why in the world is this time different? Why did he refuse to go to Nineveh? Simply put, Jonah refused to go because he hated the Ninevites. Hated them. So the second thing we learn from this passage is don't ignore racism. In the first chapter of Jonah, we're not given any clue as to why Jonah refuses to go. But in chapter 4, if you have your Bibles open, you just turn a page or two And look at Jonah 4, verses 1 through 3. God has rescued Jonah, has sent Jonah. Jonah has preached to the Ninevites, and the Ninevites repented. And here's Jonah's response to people repenting and turning to God. Chapter 4, verse 1. But it displeased Jonah exceedingly, and he... Is not this what I said 
when I was yet in my country. That is why I made haste to flee to Tarshish. For I knew that you are a gracious God and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and relenting from disaster. Therefore now, O Lord, take my life from me, for it is better for me to die than to live. In chapter 1, we're not told that a conversation between Jonah and God happens. But here, somewhere between verses 2 and verses 3, from when God tells Jonah to go and Jonah decides to run, we see that God's hatred of the Ninevites is so strong that he tells God, I am not going because when they repent, you will save them. So we see that Jonah's hatred of the Ninevites is so strong All he wants for them is destruction. He hates them so much he'd rather die than to see them repent and be saved. Now turn back with me to chapter 1 and verse 12 and see that Jonah's desire for death rather than the salvation of the Ninevites is no idle threat. When the sailors asked Jonah what to do, listen on this, there was more than one option. There was more than one option for them to be rescued from the storm. Jonah picks death. He says, I would rather die than see them repent, so throw me into the water. Because he assumes that he will die. But he had another option. If Jonah had said, I've been wrong, God is sending me to Nineveh for this storm to stop, simply turn the ship and point it towards Nineveh, and the storm will stop. Do you hear me? If Jonah had simply said, turn the ship towards Nineveh, the storm would have stopped. Had he simply done that, the vessel would have been saved, and Jonah would have been spared three days days in the belly of a great fish. Clearly Jonah hates, he despises the Ninevites. And this is why he refuses to go. He hates a group of people. It is his racism, his hatred for them. And this is something that we simply cannot ignore. Now there's been one time in my life that I hated someone on the same level that Jonah hated the Ninevites. In the days immediately after 9-11, I hated Osama bin Laden and wanted nothing but the worst for him. In fact, I hoped that our special forces would find him and kill him. Kill him rather than capture him. Why? Not for justice's sake. Because if they had captured him and they brought him to a base, maybe there would have been a chaplain at that base. Maybe there would have been a Baptist chaplain at that base. And maybe that Baptist chaplain would be a better person than me and would go and meet with bin Laden. Maybe he would have shared the gospel with bin Laden, and then bin Laden had a chance to be saved. I realize how unlikely that would be, but it's no more unlikely than the Ninevites repenting. It took time for God to show me the error of my ways and the evil that was in my heart. What Jonah teaches us is that God expects our compassion to encompass everyone, even those we hate, even our enemies. We can't ignore, as we read through these pages, we, can't, we just simply can't do it. Why did Jonah refuse to go to Nineveh? Because he hated a group of people. And racism, simply put, is hating a group of people. So brothers and sisters, we are all created in God's image. It doesn't matter our skin tone. We are all created in God's image and therefore we are equal. We're equally in need of God's grace. We're equally in need of Jesus dying on the cross. We're equally in need of Jesus rising from the dead. We're equally in need of being saved. This is a fundamental tenet of our faith. We are all equal. So when someone makes racist remarks, when they tell racist jokes, 
When they use racist words, we must show courage. This is for all of us in this room. Whatever our skin tone. There is white racism. There is black racism. There is brown racism. There is, if it were possible, green racism. Whenever and wherever racism occurs, we as Christians are told to stand up, to have courage, and speak out against it. Because every racist joke, every racist remark, every racist thought denies the image of God in somebody else. It says they're created less than me. Now Jonah should have as a prophet for God, been motivated by God's love, by God's missions, God's grace, and had gone to a people and showed compassion to them. And we too should be motivated by the same exact thing in our everyday walk. As Christians, we cannot ignore racism. We cannot hope that it will someday go away. We have to stand against it. Racism of every kind. Now let's move. We just have a moment left. So let's move on to the last point. One that should be fairly obvious from Jonah's life and learn that we cannot and we should not ever run from God. We should never run from God. Now notice something in verses 3 and verses 10. That if we read it precisely, it says that Jonah didn't run from God He ran from the presence of God. He ran from the presence of the Lord. Jonah knew that he could not run from God. In fact, in verse 9, he gives testimony to this fact when he says that God is the creator of the sea and of the dry land. You can't run from the guy who made everything. So he tries to run from God's presence. He flees from the presence of the Lord. Because when he was in God's presence, he was commanded to do something he did not want to do. So I guarantee that he wasn't on his trip to Tarshish, on his trip to Joppa. When he's in the belly of that ship, he was not doing his quiet time. Whatever amount of, passes, what amount of time that passes from verse 1 to verse 3, I guarantee that Jonah was not reading my utmost for his highest. When we're in the presence of the Lord, when we're in the presence of the Lord, be it at this place and at this time, or in our daily one-on-one walk with God, there will be times that we will hear from Him. There will be times in this place, there will be times in our daily walk with God that we will hear from the Lord. And again, if you do not hear from the Lord, If His Spirit does not speak into you, it's simply because you're not listening. Listen, because God talks to you. But here's the problem. Here's what you have to be prepared for. His plans may be very different from your plans. Is that right? His plans for me may be very different from my plans for me. And I may be tempted to say, God, I'm not into that. I am not interested. Do not send me. But here's the deal. When God tells you something different from your plans, do not run. Do not run from His presence. Do not try to escape from His plans because He knows what is best. And He calls you for a purpose. He will call you and talk to you uniquely for His purpose. You and I, those of us who believe in Jesus Christ, we are God's people, which means that we are the instruments. Even when times when we feel like we're broken, we're God's instruments to accomplish His will and His purposes. So we learn His will and His purposes from His Word and when we are called by Him. And so when God speaks to you, First of all, through His Word, and He commands you. Again, there's no age limit. 
You cannot be too young or too old for God to talk to you and command you to therefore go and make disciples. Whether you're young, whether you're old, God speaks to you. And so what we must do is listen and obey. As we talk about missions over the next several weeks, as we talk about the purpose that God has given to the church, let me call each of us to listen. Listen as we gather and listen as you walk with God. Listen and obey. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the clarity of your word that you have commanded all of us to therefore go or as we're going about our life to share the gospel, to invite people to have the same relationship with you that we have. And Father, as we meet with you in this hour or in our daily walk, Lord, give us ears to listen to you. Give us time to set apart, just to listen, that we may hear from you and obey. And Father, I pray that none of us, we've all been there, we've all been like Jonah. And Father, I pray that none of us, not ever again, that we hear from you and refuse to go. So speak to us. Father, if there's anyone in here hurting today, speak to them that they're loved. If there's anyone in this room who just thinks that they cannot be used, speak to them. Father, if there's anyone in this room who feels lonely or unloved, speak to them. Holy Spirit, may we listen to you. And be all and do all that you've ever called us to be and to do. Holy Spirit, speak into anybody in this room who may not have a saving relationship with you. That today is the day of their salvation. It's in your name that we pray. Amen. Now there's a pretty remarkable aspect of this account. The first you know, couple verses of the book of Jonah. When it tells us that Nineveh has sinned and God has seen their sin. And so he's either going to send Jonah to tell them to repent, but if they refuse to repent, he's going to send to them judgment. So that's Nineveh's option. Repent or be judged. And when God judges, it leads to destruction. So here's the incredible thing. As Ninevites have no idea that God exists, or at least the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob exists. And so they're probably sitting there saying, who who is this that's going to call us to repent? And many people today are exactly the same. Many people today ignore God or assume that God ignores them. There may be people sitting in this room thinking, I'm just going to go out In my daily life, I'm going to ignore the call to follow Jesus because God has no idea who I am and has no desire for me. But this book tells us that God notices people. Tells us that God loves people. That God wants to see people repent. A God who is active And a God who takes sin seriously. God was going to punish the Ninevites unless they listened to God's messenger and turned away from their sin. And the same is true today. If you do not have a saving relationship with Jesus Christ, if you've never decided to follow Jesus, God's plan is for to either punish or, if you repent, to receive you as his own. So it's entirely up to you. Do you want to be punished for your sins? 
Or do you want to repent or turn away from your sins and turn towards God? Today is your chance, if you have never done it before, to turn to God. Now, Bill, Bryce, and I, we're just going to be standing down front. We're not going to hang out there for very long. And what we're going to be there for is if anybody, if you've ever felt broken or if you feel broken today and you feel like God can't use you, we would love to pray with you. And just to show you that God loves you, we love you, and God can use you for His purposes. If there are people here today who are simply in need of prayer, we are here for you. These stairs are open to you. If you are looking for a place to belong, this church is a wonderful church to belong to. If you want to know more about how to turn away from your sin and turn towards God, as Chris leads us in song, the pastors will be down front, and we would love to visit with you exactly how to do it. So let me ask everyone to stand as Chris leads us in song. Let's pray. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we just come to you this morning grateful for the opportunity to be here with our church family and worship you. Lord, I lift up the, the offering that we are about to take. Father, I just pray uh, that you would just uh, take this um, small gift from us, multiply it, use it, uh, Father, in ways beyond anything that we could ever uh, know, understand, or imagine. Father, may we be good stewards of your resources. Uh, Father, and may we um, just learn to, to not run from you, Lord. But your ways are better. Lord, we ask all this in your son's name. Amen.
at the 11th hour, on the 11th day of the 11th month of 1918, the guns finally fell silent. Millions of people during World War I gave up their life so that the many could have freedom. November 11th is on Saturday this year. And it's now a day that we remember our veterans and all that they do, all that they have sacrificed, so that we can gather in a place like this, so that the many could enjoy the freedom that was bought by the few. So if you have served in the Army, in the Air Force, in the Navy, in the Marines, or in the Coast Guards, let me ask for you to stand and to remain standing. For you men and you women who have served, our thank yous will never be enough when you had to say goodbye to loved ones, family, friends, you spent holidays, birthdays, anniversaries, even births away from your family. And we just want to take a special moment to say thank you. These people deserve us standing and thanking all that they sacrificed for us. So let's do that. God bless. Have a wonderful week. Thank you.